Hello, everyone, and welcome to the April Carmine Street Metrics reading. And uh, my co-hosts, Wendy Sloan, Teresco, and I are really honored and delighted to welcome three fantastic future readers, Lauren Kemp, Josh Megan, Joshua Megan, and David Yezi. And uh, as always, we will start with a few open mic participants before um, the first feature reader. Our first open mic participant is Charlotte Innes. Charlotte, can you please unmute yourself? Okay. You can hear me, right? Absolutely. Yes. So I'm going to read, let's find it. Um, from my new uh, chat book, 20 Pandemicals, which quite a few of you know and very kindly came to my launch reading a few weeks ago. Um, I'm going to read one that I don't think I've read in public before. So, and it seems kind of appropriate for the times because I wrote it towards, I wrote all of them in 2020. And I wrote this towards the end of that year, which was an election year, as you remember. And I remember thinking, does, does good always triumph, you know? <laughs> And I feel like a lot of us are thinking about that now, like this is just too awful, it's got to end, you know. So, um, pandemical number 19. My neighbor's olive trees have grown six feet above the six foot fence, breeze blown branches leaning languidly towards the street, their tops sturdy and still above the glancing flutter Soon, like full-grown boys, they'll thicken. Heavier limbs, leaves more dense, long fingers of silver green. They rarely thicken. Some live, bear fruit, 2,000 years, so strong that people call them tree of life. Who'd not take comfort from so resolute a being? The fence keeps thieves at bay, the house, all but hidden, safe behind its wall of green. Safe from every threat? A tangled notion, like the olive of which God said, this tree of goodly fruit must burn. The people had broken their word, worshipped idols. Just wait, you'll see. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Our next open mic reader is Mark McDonald. Hi, hello. Hello. Um, just before I start, Mary Marion wants to um, extend her apologies for not being here today. She's doing a poetry uh, workshop, a live poetry workshop. So Mary says hello. Um, uh, this, I'm going to read a poem called The Box, and I, I'm not sure whether it's finished yet, but uh, reading it aloud might help me sort of decide. Um, starts with an epigraph from The Shooting of Dan McGrew. Hunger, not of the belly kind that's banished with bacon and beans. The Box. What washed ashore and filled your final room now fills this box. Kneeling, I exhume the ashtrays, jigsaws, bills you never paid, the concertina that you never played but kept out on the sideboard by a bottle, Highland Park, the stuff that's meant to settle in the glass, the good stuff, let it breathe. But soon you'd spill it, mop it with your sleeve and curse it and your luck, your absent brothers who never rang whose kids still had their mothers. And sometimes we'd be stuck like this for hours, with you half drowsed and filled with old time flowers, mumbling burns and dangerous Dan McGrew. Forgive me then if I turned away from you, glanced at my watch or stopped you in mid flow. I loved those rhymes, I did, I hope you know. Still, to cry I listen to the end if I could hear them now would be pretend, glib urgency, now that you're lost from sight. 
you'll never call again on Wednesday night past 10 o'clock to make my poor wife groan. I'd pour a drink before I took the phone to better ride the waves coming down the line. Your past, whose currents ripped through tidal time and churned your present to a foaming green and flotsam scattered wash. The pearls you'd glean shone bright for you each time. The matinees where your cowboy feet would stomp and hungry days of moonlit creeping through the turnip crops, then guising time, pulling out all the stops with Jolson tunes, with jokes and penny whistles, banging the tenement doors all hung with thistles. It was a standing joke. My wife would watch, I'd cover the phone, mouthing, he's full of scotch, it's guising time again. But I was listening, I swear, and through the dirt could hear it glistening, some secret gem. Keep digging then, repeat the stories, like someone desperate to complete a broken puzzle, find the missing piece. And there's the story that might bring you peace. Well, there's irony. I pack the stuff away. I've raked these ashes cold most every day and will again. The concertina squeeze and stretch of time, bent puzzle shapes. All these won't ever match Loch Lomond on the lid. The things that launch us, blow us off the grid, then wash us, sun blind, drying on the rocks. These mysteries humming quietly in a box. Okay, wow. that's it. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. And our next open mic reader is Chris O'Carroll. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Uh, thank you. Um, my one of one of my brothers is a doctor. And it's become kind of a family tradition to donate our bodies to the med school where he studied. Now, some people do that kind of thing out of genuine altruism, desire to you know, uh, educate the next generation of doctors. For me, it's just a really cool way to save money on funeral expenses. When the time comes, you know, my kids ship dead dad off to the med school. A semester or two later, they get back a box of ashes and a thank you note. No invoice from the funeral hall. That's a good final deal. The, the only drawback is that when the time comes and young doctors in training are taking advantage of my donation, I won't be able to have a word with them about the situation. So I thought I'd have a word with them here today. This is to a medical student dissecting my cadaver. <clears throat> You'll see me from many an angle I myself could never wangle. And I don't know how much respect it's reasonable to expect as all my scars and imperfections yield to your <clears throat> intimate inspections. In your shoes, I might deride me while I looked around inside me, eyeing the organs I abused by what I didn't use or used. So feel entitled to a joke about the flesh you slice and poke. Saving lives and easing pain are worthwhile skills you hope to gain from what my innards can reveal. If laughter aids that, no big deal. <clears throat> Someday, your manner by the bed of any patient who's not dead will feature sober empathy, but cut yourself some slack with me. Thank you. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, our next night reader is Rachel Heathers. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. It is a pleasure to be here and thinking of two poets who died this past week, Richard Howard, of course, and Kelly Cherry, whom I knew back in the day and was startled to find that she had died. It's, it's, it's great to see everybody. And I'm going to read from my Pandemic Almanac, which is one of a number of books, Charlotte's came first, that poets and others have been writing during the pandemic. This is called In the Cloud, and it is about teaching poetry on Zoom. And it was written uh, at the very tail end of 2020. I made a list I can't find now 
Where did all my folders go of words my students didn't know? Turmeric, cultus, fallacy, cadence, meringue, antigone, last but not least, Persephone, are just a few that stick with me, plucked from the poems that we read. I tried to stay a week ahead between September and December. Many more I don't remember, but think of all the words they knew or thought they knew. I thought so too. Thinking too hard though doesn't do. Words deeply pondered start to freeze as when before our tired eyes, Zoom stalls and stops and no surprise, leaving a dark screen, a blank hour to fill with after and before. Nonsense syllables devour denotations. Happy, sad, joyful or lonely, good or bad. What does this mean to you, I said. What does beautiful really mean, I asked them as I tried to lean into the noncommittal screen, scanning until my eyes were sore for the soul in each black square. Were there really people there? Did each name hide a secret face sheltering somewhere in place? some unimaginable space. Each word they may have learned from me in gen ed reading poetry carries its meaning quietly, concealed behind the livid glow of all we learned we didn't know. Alone together, here we are, stranded in our shared nowhere, marooned in space, while free from time, meanings proliferate and chime as words unfettered dance and rhyme. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you for reading from that um, great book, which at some point I will get a chance to uh, ask you to sign my copy of it. And also by the same token, um, I hope that um, everyone here um, orders books, uh, you know, Rachel's book, but also our feature, feature uh, readers, uh, Lawrence and Josh's and David's. Um, it is always um, a sort of disadvantage of the Zoom readings that we cannot, we do not have immediate access to books that the authors can immediately sign. But yeah, you know, maybe everyone, um, all, all our future readers can at some point put the some sort of a link uh, to the um, Amazon page or whatever people can uh, order the books. Um, our next open mic reader, who will be the last one before the first feature is David Formanek. Hi, Anton. Thank you very much. Hi, Wendy, Therese, Rachel, uh, everyone. Uh, yes, uh, this, is, um, this is an anagram poem that I didn't get to read uh, last month because I might have been away or I might not have signed up. Uh, in any case, um, it was, and it was originally um, hammered into the wood of an oar and the the letters were filled in with color, and I'm going to start with the um, the inscription on the panel, which uh, the the work is called Noahgrams. Uh, later, there will be uh, three initialisms that you know two of um, uh, M S S W A K and K W I M. We'll find out what that is. Uh, Noahgrams. An ark isn't a boat. An ark is a box, and its role as a source of salvation, Deucalion, Pandora, the Covenant, or Ishmael's coffin, was an old idea, even in the Bronze Age. I'd look for the ark on the Black Sea's dark floor, where the first farmers lashed their fear-filled barns to rafts, the low sea level all coasts are a mountain that oceans climbed at the ice age's end. Noahgram's part one, the mess we're in. Sink or swim, Noah's sick whim, omens scare, more score rains, mark new rise, manic sorrow. Ark man rose, cruise menace, mess anchor, morose winks, scram, more rains, common sewers, 
seek no rise. Some can row, canaries worry, sunk miners. We mask arson, suns make war, so crimson. Man is wreck. Fire is numb, sink or swim. Part two, how we got there. Sink or swim, wink or sin. Ah, wine smirks. Quirrell, now kiss. Manuscript, sealed with a kiss. Is woman risk? Soar. Know what I mean? No sark, skin, musky rose, manners wax, mirrors wink, swank summers, Nixies swarm, siren quim, caress woman, kiss arrows man, rock someone, Swing makes kin, wanker scum. Snicker miss, monks sorrow. Sink or swim. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Well, it is now my great pleasure to introduce our first feature reader, Lauren Camp. Lauren Camp is the author of five books most recently took house from Tupelo Press, which received the American Fiction Award in Poetry. Other honors include the Dorset Prize and finalist citations for the Arab American Book Award, Housatonic Book Award, North American Book Award, and a New Mexico, Arizona Book Award. Her work has appeared in Kenyan Review, Poem a Day, New England Review, Prairie Schooner, and Beloit Poetry Journal, among many other venues. And she and has been translated into Mandarin, Turkish, Spanish, and Arabic. An Emeritus Fellow of the Black Earth Institute, she has received support from Story Knife Writers Retreat, Denver Botanic Gardens, and the Taft Nicholson Center. In 2018, she was a visiting scholar poet at the Mayo Clinic, Treading Bombs of Dementia with physicians and research scientists. And she will be astronomer in residence at Grand Canyon National Park in 2022. She lives in New Mexico, where she teaches creative writing to people of all ages. So please help me welcome Lauren Camp. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anton, and um, thank you, Carmine Street Metrics. My metrics are actually based on jazz, so they're, they're not so metrical. But um, anyway, I'm going to read from my three most recent books. I'm terribly honored to be here and to read with Josh and David. God of the Clustered Night. Juniper berries are little prayers or small ghosts, or blue sacks that settle like dust in our throats. Under the house with no roof, people dance in numb light. Where bones chafe against dirt, others walk on fire in circles of knowledge. People crowd in with dissonant blankets in the posture of each other's heartbeat. Wind churning sage mixes with mercury, arsenic, rusted metal. So I picked that because I am in New Mexico. It is juniper season right now, pollen season. Um, I'm going to switch to Took House. This is a pandemic book, though it really has nothing to do with the pandemic. And I'll read you a couple of poems from this. The first one I want to read is called Splendid. Yes, it was splendid, play, praying wholly with liquor to the 12 bar pattern of his tragic. Our hands and fingers, the interior weather, such latent languor. The waiter was never far from the mouth of our error, 
and ready to please us, to place fuller glasses beside us, filled with disorder. Over and over we sat at a table without days, our lips scarlet with logic and random syntax. We sat through summer's collar, sat through sweet mustard and drought, my soft opinions, his signatures, then winter's slaughtering wind spread on the desert. We perfected ours, our small infinities and unremarkable habits, the flesh, our last words. Of course, at some point, we at the table were reminded only of breathing, that echo and echo. Tookhouse also has poems, about a, a half dozen poems about raptors, and I want to read one of them to you. It's called Golden Eagle. Nearly silent from the cliff, the great bird unties his wings in curves and rolls through open air. Such searching. He lowers to find flesh, his silhouette obedient to the sky's bewildered blue. Patrol, tilt. In three, two, one, the root turns perpendicular. His narrow, awful face quickens on perishable landscape. Everything in the open, pitches and voices, some echoes. He grabs enough for one, ignores the moan. At the table, was I greedy? I hardly ate, only what I needed. I'm gonna try out a couple of new poems on you. See how these go. The first one is called Legend. Gone our temporary selves in that devouring town, the house warm paneled in wood and laminate, poked back from the street and the universal puddles. Gone that careless and how filled up we were on our own benediction and ramshackle infinity and this and that and we took it all to the roses on fire at each endless moon. Took horizontal our remarkable synonymous pleasures while some bum grabbed our grass eater, our orange doorknob had a festival with my wallet and ghost looped alphabet. And now I am interrupted only by the disregarded. Neither of us thought of the glib lives of fishes or saw plain what a mirror could hover. The future was so far from the present. And maybe that's all there is to say. From flour, we curved to round bread we ate and the scallop of streets and the turn of the streets and the train platforms, my bike, and the trips bowed against earth. I made those trips full of me. And I am today at a lake in Vermont, water lying around blue and glowing as three teens get drunk on selfies and flamboyant extra flesh. I wander into the enunciation of their laughter while bending through my old mental photos of body and almost all the way into the land of keys and my greedy sweetening ways. Gone all the forks we carried cross country. The cicadas form a blanket, their sounds a jinx, a hex, a carved mark wiping my cheek. So despite the fact that the pandemic has left us all inside, um, at the very end of last year for the last, I guess, three or four months, I had the chance to, um, to be an artist in residence, really a poet in residence for the Denver Botanic Gardens, which meant focusing on plants and nature, which is one of the few things that seems to keep going despite whatever we're doing. Um, my project, in addition to looking around the gardens and just communing with the plants, was to find optimism. 
And I'm glad I tasked myself with that because I sure needed it. So I thought I'd read you one of a dozen poems that I wrote during the residency. It's called Rocky Ground. Before we do what we have to do, the dishes, the folding of laundry, I offer to wreck you with what I know now, which is impractical new buds on the succulents, the contraptions of petals they've grown. Before we do what we need to do, the tending of worry, the garbage, the leftover grief, I remind you the mid-air billow of milkweed from summer's lush mouth. Before we return to deadlines and details, our humanity neatly boxed up, turn to whatever my friend Joan calls impending doom. I offer you the fire wheels, straight sunning ruby and snow angel blossoms wide open as hearts. Let's watch the muzzles of insects at each flower bell, having parted the curtains to reach what they need. This moment, that's what we have to stop heartbreak. Inward brimming light, the day sounds and tulips inverted hats, nothing to fail at. Everything is wind rivulet and small graces and paired doves with their mothering tones. Now is a matter of spirit without sorrow. Now is feather and branches, seeds again in this pine-throated sphere, now where I live. I have one last poem for you. It comes from my book, 100 Hungers, which came out in 2016 and covers, um, imagines my father's childhood growing up in Baghdad, Iraq, um, and his family's displacement from their homeland, sort of a uh, forced fleeing in 1950. And I want to read you this one poem and offer again thanks to Anton and team for the chance to be here to read here um, today. The poem is called Letter to Baghdad. Even if my father never speaks a word of it, I will know he brought a candle, a cough, and the occupied side of his heart. I will know the trees held him, that they rose above roof lines and where they met, he climbed and saw roads paved only with praises. The sun he shouldered across oceans turned copper at his window. I saw it too on the gray edge of my childhood and I was marked when each day awoke. He devoured the silence, the parts that could not be cured. And when he was hungry for it, I swallowed that silence, his self-portrait of confession. When I found an old shawl and silver teapot in the oven and he pretended he didn't know what they meant, I remembered bitter lemons had moistened his mouth. What he inhaled from his copious memory left his tongue empty, then full. And somehow I know his tongue will always be brushed with the leaving. One day we were talking about beginnings and I had begun. I wasn't at the center anymore and we kept letting in a little air and he showed me a word for the boy he once was. And he showed me this Arabic word. And in this way, I knew this was the most authentic morning I would ever see. And I saw it and he said it again and we were covered with it, entirely covered. This was his home, he said, as he gave me the address, the place where the first time and the spurned and the color and the milkmaid stood in the alley. And even though he didn't tell me about yesterday and the day 
and the day, and I never saw any other way to tell it. I never saw heaven or the land that was black. One day I knew enough to take the word from him and sip every little thing, every steeped thing. And there were many trees and not enough cold. And we sat by the river that curves in every direction and our hearts lifted up to the birds. Thank you. Wow, thank you so very much, Lauren. That was fantastic. I, I would like to invite everyone to unmute themselves and applaud and express our appreciation. Thank you so much. And then um, again, hopefully, you know, all, or uh, some of you or many of you can order Took House or any of the other books by Lauren. So we're going to proceed to um, some more open mic readers. And our next open mic participant is Meredith Bergman. I have a new poem I'm still tinkering with um, called Keeping Time. And it is in um, what I'm calling uh, inverted terza rima, except when it gets out of the past and then it goes into ordinary, so to speak, terza rima. Keeping time with apologies to clergyman and philosopher William Paley. Suppose I struck my foot against a stone in Central Park, perhaps, and looking down, I find the watch I lost in 91. It's not the slender, silly, gold one, which I asked for after I turned 21, which was my first real lady's jewelry watch. I have it still. I never wear it out. My parents didn't celebrate me much on landmark birthdays. That one time, I thought I'd ask my father's father to mark the day by paying for a grown-up watch. I got a Longines with a metal band that make my wrist break out. No, my lost watch was black, avant-garde, a movado. That time I paid. It had a leather strap. Its face was blank. I bought it for myself at a museum, the kind in which, rather than looking back, we celebrate the things we make that seem most likely to convey the present moment to future viewers whom we hope will see them. Grandpa had chuckled over what I'd meant to be a solemn ceremony. So you need me to buy you trinkets. His intent was kind. I couldn't find the right words though for this occasion to make him see how much I wanted evidence to show myself of someone watching over me. And did time stop? I let that moment go. I learned to make time matter on my own. My hands are always moving, fast or slow. Suppose that I am freed when fully grown from watchfulness. My feet might bring me where at last. I happen on that well-timed stone. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Next up in my reader is Bob Wright. Hi, everyone. Uh, this poem is a uh, bit inspired by um, some photographs that were uh, police archives that my friend and wonderful photographer, Tom Goodman has uh, downloaded and, and manipulated and uh, it inspired some poems about the uh, people in the photographs. Mugshot, the, in the indigent. This place reminds you of the barn at home, the sound of buckets scraping on the concrete floor, the cold that travels up your feet until you feel the roots of your teeth tremble. It takes the breath from you. You love the smell of fresh drawn milk, love to stir it, love to watch the froth settle as the cream was blended, love to mix it with a rosewood stick that smelled of newborns and the lush of skin. You said, you couldn't, they said you couldn't sleep inside the borders of the park. They said you'd swipe laundry from the lines. 
How could you say to them it was the scent of sunlight drew you in? It would have worked for shirts and shoes, but you were driven off with shouts and stones were called old slag. Sometimes they let you go, sometimes they'd open up the door and say, clear off, they'll let me see you here again, but not today. You close your eyes and see the bucket topped with milk. I know it's sunlight that calls to you a single eye that draws you far away and stirs those memories from deep inside. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Next, the next reader is Arthur Russell. Hi. Hi, Anton. Hi, Wendy. Um, I wanted to read a poem. <clears throat> you know, I, 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 I studied with Josh Megan in uh, his versification class and his sonnet class. And uh, eventually I wound up writing this poem and dedicating it to him. All, although it's not strictly uh, iambic pentameter, there's a couple of sextameters in there as well. Um, so this is for Josh, it's called Julie Hirsch. Julie Hirsch, the orchestra leader at Midwood, remonstrated with the parent crowd for quiet. He closed his eyes briefly as he turned back to us and his tux black arms with white cuff borders stretched out to reveal the tendons raised up under his wrists. We saw his right hand open towards us as in peace and the thumb of his left hand curled around the cork knob handle of the dinged up ivory white baton that I had seen abandoned on his music stand so many times as I left practice, powerless without him to command the scores and us to play. His mustache was beautiful. His eyes were so sad. His smile rose in tandem with his arms. Oh, Mr. Hirsch, I have that quiet now in my life that I need to begin. Thank you, and thank you again to Joshua. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, one more open mic reader before a second feature, before Josh, before you can hear from Josh. Um, next open mic reader is Gina Gruz. Anton, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to read in Carmen Street Matrix. And I will read one very short poem called Breakfast. Rhinoceros sneaks into cafeteria before tigers ran out of meat. Flamingo sips chocolate syrup. Zebras chew glass flavored gum and the keeper of plastical and animal kingdom where no one survives, enjoys in the morning sunny side up. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Great. So it is now my great pleasure to introduce, jo introduce uh, Josh Megan. Joshua Megan lives in Brooklyn. His second poetry collection Accepting the Disaster, was cited in the TLS, the New York Times Book Review, and elsewhere as a best book of 2015. His poems have appeared in periodicals including The New Yorker, The New Republic, and Poetry, which awarded him its 2013 Levinson Prize. He received fellowships from the National Endowment of the Arts for the Arts and the Guggenheim Foundation. From 2017 to 2020, he taught at Northwestern University as a visiting poet. Welcome, Joshua Egan. Hi, thank you. Uh, you can hear me? Yeah, you can. Okay, great. Sorry. Um, thank you very much, Anton. Thanks. Um, thanks to everyone. Thanks to Therese and Wendy and uh, Carmine Street Metrics, and it's great to be here. Um, 
Uh, thanks to David and uh, thanks to Lauren, our uh, um, prefatory, uh, or not prefatory, thanks to David. Uh, sorry, I'm crazy. It's been three years of uh, locked into my apartment, so I apologize. Um, uh, uh, thanks uh, also to the people who uh, have, have been participating in the open mic, and thanks. Don't want to overlook anyone who is just in the audience uh and not uh not reading poems so thank you um and i also wanted to say happy national pottery month um my first poem uh these are new poems three new poems um uh first poem is a riddle it's based on um you know it's it's an anglo-saxon like it's based on the poems of the exeter book uh uh if you know those um riddle most mornings I stir, I seem strange to myself. I, one day farther, I, one night nearer, I roll and I sigh and I turn. I lie, I write myself, I stand up soon. Though I still am unsteady, I spring my shade, then do what I do. And I am done then, and night returning, I tug the ring to draw the blind on what is undone. All that I am one day nearer and one night nearer alone, lie in yellow light, look at my legs, wonder who, why also, and what has happened to what I am and what I am, I do not know. What am I? Okay, uh, second poem, it's called The Stepfather. This poem is fairly self-explanatory. Uh, the Stepfather. Everyone loved him. He was good at that. And he was a success. He was someone who got pretty far in life without much help. He could be charming. He was clubbable. I did not love him. I did not love his warm and easy laughter. I did not love the man. Everyone else did. That was their mistake. I never loved him. I never loved the man. And he, he said himself, he hated me, but he was a success. He was a person who would ask in simple earnest, what you do, and as you spoke, would listen and knit his brow and nod with comprehension or ask how, widen his eyes and laugh or frown with you, and when you finished, would sip his drink and smile and say, so tell me again, what is it you do? I did not love him. I did not like the sound of his big laugh. I didn't like his face. I am not happy and I am not sorry to be here sitting in his usual place. Okay, uh, my third and last poem is a strange, a strange poem. It's a, it's a little bit longer. Um, uh, it's, uh, it requires a little bit of explanation. It's called Demo Mode. It's a, it's a Long blank first poem, uh, not that long, but long longer than those two. Um, uh, demo mode is the mode that it, uh, you know an arcade video game goes into after a game is over, and it shows how to play the game, and it shows you know it shows like a high score results, uh, so on. Um, the epigraph uh, to this poem is falling asleep after a long bad drive, five a.m. Um, so the protagonist of the poem has just driven for hours and is now in bed uh, after being up all night driving a truly hellish drive. Um, the driving described is not real. Um, it's uh, a magic experience. So the, the person being described is uh, it's his he's on the edge of sleep remembering the hell of driving. Maybe some of you had this happen where you drive for hours and hours and hours, and then you can't 
stop seeing driving um, in your head. So the, the person is on the edge of sleep. Um, also the hypnagogic stuff and in bed, lying in bed, okay? The hypnagogic stuff is um, compared to a, a video game and specifically uh, the video game Galaga, which I don't know if anybody knows that. It's an old school uh, coin-op arcade game. Um, and it's, uh, it's you know, sort of like a, um, a space shooter, you know, shooting other spaceships. Um, and it was popular in the early 80s. Uh, and I played it very obsessively. Uh, um, I would go into a pool hall where uh, there were mostly people drunk and with, you know, smoking and dangerous people. Uh, and I would go play Galaga in this place all day long. Um, uh, maybe some of you know it. Finally, I use the expression, uh, I mean, maybe some of you know the, the, the not the pool hall, the video game. Um, uh, uh, I use the expression gaffed wheel in this poem, um, and, which is con man jargon for uh, a fixed roulette wheel. Sorry for the long explanation. Demo mode. Falling asleep after a long bad drive, 5 a.m. Like coming to already on the run in darkness with the small lights soundlessly ordering and reordering themselves outside, alone like that at night, not seeing the panel of impartial instruments or their consolatory glow, aware only of the repeated scenery always appearing, arising from nothing, and so easily disappearing into the edges of the visual field. This suffering the wheel composed the will until you only understood one thing. You must keep going. Yes, you must get home. He drove. Or anyway, the car went. How, he couldn't say. It just did. It was like a dark ride at the carnival, but fast. Then, traveling through the dark, he got a feeling. It was as if the car were somehow changed, better, as if the car had understood. It was exciting. It was dangerous. This wasn't hard. But it was just like life, that whole way forward opening forever the white dash flashing, orange road reflectors in strange evocative configurations, the red lights gone ahead or falling back afloat on darkness, curve, incline, another, suspiciously alike, and everywhere nighttime. And don't forget the body too, inert and never once so credibly a thing as now, dead weight, forever trying in spite of turns and slopes to keep on going the same direction. It was all one thing, mechanical, monadic, just like life, as if the whole way forward ran along a chain conveyor, the chains well camouflaged below a moving surface, maybe road. It was too dark to tell. And then you knew. You felt in the grotesques of orange dots monotonously reconfiguring, the vistas seeming rise and fall and rise through a mysterious course of slopes and turns and the associated queasy burden of gravity. And you supposed it meant progress, as if you really had been going from here to there. Sure, sure. But now he knew. It was a gaffed wheel. Here, there, what there? There wasn't any there. And what might feel like movement, brother, that was something else. That was activity, like seeing or being, like drifting. It was just like life, it went. In the next moment with a violent start, he might descry some sudden threat, the instant whatever it was was right in front of him. And then too late, it was the end, except Somehow it all kept going just the same. It passed. Same cheap looped scenery, no depth, as in the moments after you were killed, but hadn't yet absorbed the fact or quit your prized spot at the Golden Age arcade game. When, independent of your will, the system, since you had not achieved galactic hero, would enter demo mode. And on the screen, the field of stars kept running in a loop. Stars looped and not a sound, all sense of time and space collapsing, 
that was Galaga. That was like this, this was like that. But when, as always in that game, the stars had run on into demo mode, results, then score, adduced in silence, rival craft in silence, throbbing above your craft, no longer yours, till shocking and routine, the model sorties fell with a sound of falling, tractor beam and fighter captured, then the copyright. In those low moments, he had stood no quarter and stared as through the idle interval a part of him, the quickest part went on in stealth, maneuvering, maneuvering. He drove, or anyway, the car went. How it seemed almost immaterial. It just did. The mind, too, when you came to think of it with such a craft, loved, obsolete machine, no player, never, golden age arcade game and demo mode, the mind kept going like the dark rides at a carnival, but fast, kept going. It was so confusing. Oh, he'd always known. He knew it at 15, at 12, when he stood a few feet back, both hands hung buzzing by his sides, no player still primed as always to respond, the old extraterrestrial imperative. He felt it now, within, and he kept going following with his mind and with his caring, because he also understood he must infer position and velocity from curves and from dead weight, from silver orange points, from the points and points, point after point after point, more from points of silver orange and sometimes up ahead, red eyes that rose and sank through night like Vanta Black. And so he also understood he must obey that system, which was memoryless, no stars, no sorties, and no tractor beam. And though it wouldn't change a goddamn thing, he must keep going. That was the whole point. It really didn't matter what he wanted. And the stark facts grew starker all the time. There was no respite, no, no letting go, not of the hard involuntary effort, like trying to control a bowling ball after you let it go by leaning hard away from the inexorable gutter, not of his weight, not of his hands' malefic grip on the wheel, the wheel gone too, the hands, the body gone, only the mind itself traveling too fast out in the open. Still, he must get somewhere, where he wasn't sure. It wasn't even possible to stop, not till he reached the end, not till he'd moved from the place he himself was in already to the one he had been in all along. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Josh. So great to hear you and hear your new work. Um, again, I will ask everyone to unmute them, everyone who would like to unmute themselves. Yay! Great work. Yay. Yay. Everyone. Very nice. Thank you. Amazing. What a master. I love it. Thank you. I love that. So we will continue with our open mic. And our next open mic reader is George Green. I'd like to read a poem called uh, Daniel King. And uh, forgive me for uh, treating you like my students, but I, I, there's a couple of things I'd like to. Uh, our toe is that. Uh, lunatic French poet and theorist who uh, inspired the uh, avant-garde uh, uh, dramatist in the 1960s. The Marshalsea prison is where Dickens was humiliated and where he suffered as a child. And it's also where the novel, little, much of the novel Little Door takes place. Uh, uh, this poem that I'm reading, it's, 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 a true, it's all true, okay? All right, Daniel King. Daniel King was a talented contortionist and acrobat, and we were grammar school artos together, putting on monster plays in his basement and garage. We learned from pals of monster magazines to make our monster faces with his mom's cosmetics, toilet paper, Vaseline, and talcum powder. Multiple mirrors and dry ice, dry ice worked our miracles along with wigs and masks and Christmas lights and candles. We were our toes who lived on cherry cokes and candy and Daniel's brother Ricky was our servant. Daniel had been held back and was repeating the fifth grade 
when we became our toes together. His dad had died and his mom was a secret drunk who liked our plays and let us smoke and bootleg Applejack in her sprawling junk filled house. We were our toes, though Mrs. King would have preferred cock toes. But soon enough, our theater closed when Daniel and I were ruined by a Marshall C. Prison middle school. Daniel dropped out of high school in his junior year and his drinking accelerated mightily as he became a Santa Claus and supermarket clown, blowing balloons up in the Kroger parking lot. He was a sex addict as well. And some of our friends were nervous when their daughters wriggled on his lap at Christmas time. His mother kept his clown clothes and his Santa outfit laundered, but wouldn't let him live with her, no way. Daniel's alcoholism progressed until he wasn't welcome anywhere indoors. And so he lived under a bridge or in abandoned cars until at 52, he had a heart attack and died. Ricky, meanwhile, got hired at Mount Nebo, the enormous state-run 19th century home for the feeble-minded. Impressive towered buildings overlooked a scenic valley from a hilltop, but by the 70s, the place was so neglected and corrupt that Ricky used a cattle prod to herd the inmates to and from their smelly dorms. Ricky had become a evil henchman, a negor, a role he had perfected in our plays. Thank you. Thank you, George. Our next open mic reader is Harvey Sauce. Okay. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Uh, this poem is called War Criminal. And the epigraph is, the International Criminal Court does not act quickly. It took them what seemed like a life sentence for us to bring the charges, no less find him guilty. Throwing a quilt consisting of body parts, those of men, women, and children over his defense, asphyxiating it. Unborns sucked from the wombs of their mothers by thermobaric bombs, needlepoint clusters of them provided the closing argument, prosecutors visibly shaking as they delivered their remarks in The Hague. The defendant, provably not so pro-life as past pronouncements would suggest. Berms of the mounded dead effectively changed the landscape of Eastern Europe. Shrieks of the suddenly childless, motherless, fatherless could be heard outside the courtroom off-key choristers so piercingly keen that even his defenders shrank from them. Reporters, their notebooks yellowing, put it to the public. He doesn't look so big now, does he? Sweat glistening on his balding head, rattling his shackles like the ghost of empire past. With no judo move to kick his way out of a guilty verdict, a thumbs down after his historic attempt to secure his place on Interpol's most wanted and history's least wanted lists. Every so often, when ruling on procedural delays, a shiver was observed to pass through the panel of three judges, perhaps a wave of realization that what occurred was anything but banal to those homeless and orphans gathered on the courthouse steps, awaiting a verdict so long in coming that by the time it was read aloud, some of us had already forgotten his name. Thank you. Thank you, Harvey. Next up in my reader is John Foy. Anton, thanks. Um, thanks uh, to everyone uh, here at the reading. It's a pleasure to, um, to hear Lauren and Joshua and um, David very soon. Um, 
I am going to read a uh, new poem. Um, it's a guzzle, an ancient Arabic form, and it's based on couplets. And it's dedicated to a girl named Jane Eldridge, um, who was the first girl I ever fell in love with. I think she fell in love with me too. We were eight years old and I never saw her again after that. It was during a, um, a vacation on Cape Cod. And that's what the poem is about. Um, it's called On a Line from Keith Richards. It's great to be here. It's great to be anywhere. Well, yes, I suppose, to be here, to be anywhere. I'm not convinced that great is quite the word. It's good to be here, probably anywhere, but who am I to say? It almost seems that I was never here or anywhere. And you, where are you now these long years? You might be somewhere, here or anywhere. Back then when we were eight, Jungle Gym, Cape Cod, it could have been here or anywhere. When I left you that summer, your blonde hair, I gave up hope of here, of anywhere. I looked for you for years in cyberspace, but you're not there, not here, not anywhere. We hung like monkeys on the monkey bars and knew that here was not just anywhere. But as you might expect after so much time, the here begins to look like anywhere. How can you hide like this from me? I would leave here, go anywhere. But I, John Foy, have nothing left to say. You are not here or there or anywhere. Thanks. Well, thank you, John, because I'm reminded also of Philip Larkin's not to be here, not to be anywhere, nothing more terrible, nothing more true. Um, our next reader is David M. Katz. Thank you, Anton. Um, this is uh, a sonnet um, called To the Age, and um, it's a condemnation uh, of our current age, but of the con but also of the concept of ages in general. To the age. There are so many things you do not like, but cannot change yourself. You are a mule that will not leave its stall. Your bones ache. Your when and what you are. You are no fool, but neither are you smart. You make demands. You dictate how we talk about ourselves, supply material for our labels, brands, and dirty jokes, the canned goods on our shelves. We've taken you for jazz and innocence, things that change, although you stay the same for all the time you're here. You make no sense except to stand for our collective shame. We each pass through you like the stagnant air, a darkened cloud, this toxic atmosphere. Thank you, David. We have a couple more open mic readers. Our next open mic reader is Alex Peppel. I'm going to read a poem, uh, more of a spring poem. Uh, it's titled March Tooth Flux. So the march, you could take it both in the noun and verb sense. So here goes. Its needle point through a slit in the car port breaks, stitched a cicatrix of green and grew into a crisscross of sword sticks. It steadied and fanned out blades within days, flashing a celadon fist of skeleton, spread out to a hand 
of flower, thy sun rays. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Next up, Linda Stern. Thank you, Anton, Therese, and Wendy for the opportunity to read, and it's a pleasure to be here. The, uh, the name of this poem is Garments of Light, Garments of Skin. And there is an epigraph from Rabbi Ismar Shorsh. According to the Zohar, we are not to imagine that prior to the garments of skin made by God for Adam and Eve, they were utterly naked. On the contrary, their original garb consisted of light in consonance with the purity of their earthly paradise. Garments of light, garments of skin. I am wondering now about the fate of Eve, that she was to suffer in childbirth. But what exactly was the plan before serpent and apple? Childbirth, I'm thinking, was not punishment, but reward. Those months of swollen ankles, nausea, backache, those hours of tidal pain that wells up and sweeps down in black convulsion, the blood, the shamelessness of the childbirth bed, the grasping hunger for the infant new made out of a dark and reluctant cavity. How can that be punishment when Eve is so near to death and heaven, so soaked through with light and life? No, I don't think so. Childbirth was Eve's reward. And Adam's punishment for cowardice? Relegation to the lesser role of ejaculator so that he might spend eternity searching, stalking, seeking to regain those clothes of light. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. I am now delighted to introduce our third teacher reader. David Yezik's latest books of poetry are Black Sea from 2018 and More Things in Heaven, New and Selected Poems, which just came out in 2022. Uh, he recently performed the title role in King Lear at the Baltimore Shakespeare Factory. Welcome, David Yezzi. Thank you, Anton. Thanks, everybody. So nice to see so many friendly faces, and I look forward to uh, the time when we can be back at Otto's uh, and greet each other in person. Um, but in the meantime, it means a lot to, um, to hear your poems and uh, to be able to read a few uh, for you. Um, thanks to Carmine Street for having me. Uh, if you were in Philadelphia uh, last week and came to the Hot L reading, uh, I apologize. There's going to be a considerable overlap with the poems I read today, but I'll start <clears throat> uh, by reading uh, uh, a new poem, new since uh, the new and selected, and then maybe I'll read a, a couple from the new section of uh, More Things in Heaven. Uh, this is called Old Faust. Um, and uh, there's sort of an Easter egg um, at the end, um, which is not crucial, I think, to the poem, but if you happen to notice it, uh, there's a little bit of a quotation from uh, Camus the Stranger uh, at the end of the poem. So um, sort of a literary uh, uh, brackets for this. Uh, Old Faust. Forty years ago, I would have sold my soul, like him, for a love so strong the self dissolves in it. And it's possible I did. For beauty feels blameless when frozen in a stereopticon, two in one, a sepia-toned moment of pure radiance the star inside the sapphire's liquid blue. And I do it again, 
only more so, to be sanctified like that, brushed by grace, held harmless, if only as an illusion in that dazzling light. It will not come again, not now, at my age. What's past is all there is, and what remains seems hardly worth the candle. No one inquires or seeks to take some benefit from my hard-won knowledge, and truly I have little left to give. The days are an abscess whose odor chokes the patient in his bed. I long for them to be done. All that's left to hope, you know the rest cries of execration. I am a madman and his victims all in one. Uh, this next poem uh, from More Things in Heaven, which um, as Anton said, has just come out and um, has an epigraph uh, that I uh, came across online. Uh, which reads, uh, it's from CNN, the epigraph reads, they went to an abandoned home to smoke weed. Inside, they found a tiger. CNN. Uh, the poem is called Tiger, Tiger, though tiger with a Y, uh, like William Blake's tiger. Tiger, tiger. Strong bud, mind splitting, hydroponic, pure indica, body high, one hit weed, grown from Hawaiian seeds in a closet in a double wide in Maine, up near Canada. To say it unleashed the tiger is to say everything and nothing. To say that they had failed to foresee the consequences of their actions is to be complicitly young. Eve had the weed, and Adam had the papers. And they'd been having sex, in fields and organ lofts and in abandoned houses. Even so, you never forget your first tiger. Nor had they dreamed it, like the Argentine writer Julio Cortazar, who imagined how it might be possible to share a living space with a wild creature, or, more to the point, how it would not be possible. What if the tiger claimed more and more space until the house was split in half? The parlors and the dining room and the foyer and the stairs would become the tigers, and the rest, under threat, cramped and because the thermostat was in the half gone out of bounds, cold. So here they were, the boy and the girl, and the weed, though they hadn't even gotten around to smoking it, when this sleek shimmer and ripple of muscle entered the room. At first they were not afraid of it. Rather, they fully expected that, wherever they went, extraordinary things would follow them. And if that took the form of an emerald, emerald eyed carnivore with a voice like a fault line, then this was only different in degree and not in kind from what they had come to feel was the new normal of their time together, both high and sober, either in public, at the movies, under the Milky Way, in the bushes, or in the dark secret confines of a house where no one had lived for years except a tiger. There was nothing really strange about it, only that they began to fear for its care over time, sweeping out the rooms, arranging for food and medicine should the tiger fall ill with a viral infection or superation from an ingrown claw. But wasn't it their tiger? They had found it. My tiger is your tiger, she had told him. 
Finding a forever home for a tiger is not easy, said the game warden, who took the tiger in, bathed it, and kept it in a cage for future transfer to a willing zoo, where its movements would be remarked on the way that memories are, at a distance, through wrought iron bars, the tiger grown listless, eyes dimmed, except on those occasions when a pair of stoned kids, holding hands and pausing before it, gaze in and recognize something familiar, and, full of mischief and impunity, guided by a sense of natural law, whisper a secret plan to set it free. Um, I'll read uh, one more poem and then maybe just close with a very short poem. Uh, I don't think this needs any uh, kind of setup. Uh, it's called What's Changed? The thing that stung me most after you died was how I couldn't tell my news to you. It made it so my good days barely mattered. Nearer your age today, I realize, surprisingly, because it's unfamiliar, that just now I am ludicrously happy. I think of you. How pleased you were to hear when things were going well, when life was all you'd hoped for me, your daily inward prayer. I feel you here. A house wren chirps outside. An airplane rides home in the higher air. So quiet, you can hear me. Leaves, a breeze. An hour on, this windfall will be gone. This news is for you alone. I say it quickly while I am once again, briefly, your son. <clears throat> uh, and this last poem, apologies if, uh, if you've heard it before, it's a short poem uh, about origami. It's called Crane. Paper creased is, with a touch, made less by half, reduced as much again by a second fold. So the wish to press our designs can diminish what we hold. But by your hand's careful work, I understand how this unleaving makes of what's before something finer, and finally, more. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so very much, David. Please, everyone, please unmute yourselves. Yay! Yeah! yeah. Beautiful, David. Thank you. Wonderful. Excellent, David. Another round, another round of applause for all of our uh, feature readers. Oh, yeah. Lauren, for Josh, for David, so for everyone in the open mic. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, this was a fantastic reading, and uh, I hope that you join us again um, on May 1st, when we'll have uh, Jeff Harden, Janet Kenny, and Richard Wakefield. Thank you so much.